Welcome to the EndoSync meeting. It's July 5th. Today we have a special guest, Paolo Fragomeni, who's going to give us a presentation on NAT hole punching uh, as pertains to his company's product, Socket Supply Co. Uh, and we are evaluating, we're evaluating Socket Supply Co as a potential shell for um, for confined front ends with uh, within the context of the Endo project. Uh, this is, of course, mutually interesting to our friends at Spr Sprightly Goblins who are doing something similar to what we are doing with Endo, um, uh, except on uh, Guile's scheme. And we collaborate with them on a, um, uh, a protocol for uh, decentralized object-oriented message passing that is tentatively called OCAPN. Um, and I'm going to turn over the floor to Paolo, and please take it away. Okay, um, I'm going to turn off my video, and I'm going to turn on screen sharing if I can if I can figure that out. And there's probably a button somewhere. There's I probably a button that I need to press in order to give you that actual uh, one moment in order to reveal that button for cool. you. Uh, I'm going to make you a co-host. That is probably the easiest way. Oh, perfect. I see it. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, I see, I see stop recording. I see. There should be a button with an arrow in the middle of a, a square or squircle, as it were, uh, labeled share screen. At the bottom next to the participants. Um, I don't see it. I see a chat button. So reaction settings more participants security um <clears throat> oh uh allow participants to share screen i don't see a share screen button on myself sorry uh, this problem. in the meeting top uh i'm not in the top if it if you have like a different mm. uh, different drop downs I think in the meeting drop down, this says start share. If you want my. Well, I wonder. I wonder if this is a problem because I'm on the web. Uh, I'm on the web. I don't have the app installed, so maybe that could be a problem. It doesn't have visibility through. Um, Sharing the does exist on the web. Uh, I'm gonna open up the web client okay. and check if I can find it. Yeah, I'm using the web client um, right and now. And if it's a problem, bottom, there's a screen share uh, button next to participants. That's what I see. Okay. Uh, I'm going to check that changes things. There you are. Um, do we see a screen? Yep, we see your screen and you are audible. Cool. Okay. I'm going to kill this version of that. Um, okay. Uh, and just uh, double check audio. Good. You're good. Okay, cool. Um, all right, <clears throat> then I'm going to uh, I'm going to do this. Do not disturb. And then I'm going to close this. 
Let me do this. Okay, uh, so I'm currently at the Telefonica office in Berlin, and I just gave this presentation. So I'm going to do it again, and uh, it will be even better this time. <laughs> uh, so uh, you guys are, are, are already familiar with what we're doing. Um, you're already familiar with why you want to do it um, peer to peer, plus, you also understand the um, the, the kind of downside of the cloud and why we want to add peer to peer into the mix. Uh, I did this kind of interesting thing where I sort of talked about how we got there, how we got to the point of not um, being super happy with the cloud. Um, you guys will all sort of understand all of this already. Um, <clears throat> kind of interesting, so I'll go through it anyways. Um, so yeah, mainframes, highly centralized, personal computers, very decentralized, client server. Okay, we have a problem here. It's a bit of a bottleneck, right? Millions of people trying to connect to a small handful of servers. Peer-to-peer um, -peer was really the answer uh, to uh, to that problem, although it created a new problem. Uh, copyright uh, holders were quite anxious about the whole situation. Um, and also, uh, it was pretty difficult to use and uh, even more difficult to, uh, to work on. Um, it was a sort of a... Um, Kind of a knowledge um, that that was coveted, not not necessarily shared too much, and so really cloud kind of beat that out just by having uh, the the best developer experience. Um, but cloud has clearly a problem with it, which is that it gets more expensive as you scale up. Um, I'm just blasting through this stuff, so anybody stop me if you want. Um, yeah, peer to peer, obviously, uh, you can say the inverse uh, is true. Um, it gets cheaper, more reliable. As uh, as you grow, uh, servers are a bottleneck. Peers are less of a bottleneck. This is a pretty fun slide. Um, there's about 15 billion mobile devices in the world right now, so you know some some small segment of that, if you can capture it, is uh, you know, can be can be just as reliable as uh, as AWS. Um, uh, meaning that a lot of contributions kind of add up to a robust network if you have a good peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Um, data proliferation, obviously a good argument for, um, you know, why we want to go this direction, uh, and, and the direction being, um, ubiqu ubiquitous computing. So we have hardware proliferation and we have, um, <clears throat> and we have data proliferation and, um, and all of that sort of points to, we're not, we're not really in the cloud computing era anymore. We're leaving that and we're about to embark, uh, we're about to enter the ubiquitous computing era and, uh, peer to peer is going to be driving that. Uh, what that looks like is uh, the cloud moving away, uh, moving away from the cloud towards edge, which we're, we've seen this trend. Um, you know, we saw Dino raise a bunch of money. We saw Versal raise a bunch of money. We saw all these people talking about the edge and how the edge was super important. The edge is really a, a, a sort of half step on the path to peer to peer. Um, and I think this is important uh, real quickly. It's an interesting talking point. Um, you know, all the sensors and AI and stuff is going into everything that's um, that's on the devices. It's it's not it's not being created. It's not being consumed on you know uh, uh, servers that are in Frankfurt or New York or wherever. They're where where we're where we're headed is away from the edge. We're headed away from the data center. Round trips to those servers don't make any sense, um, especially at the velocity and the volume that we're creating data. Uh, so um, so this is a little illustration here. Where we have some servers, and obviously it's a hub and spoke model, and we're moving away from that, where servers are there, but maybe they're there, but they're less important. Um, but you know, the thing that I've seen in the last sort of I don't know ten years uh, of running peer to peer conferences, being involved in peer to peer, especially with DTN conference, is that um, a lot of people really don't know how peer-to-peer -peer works. Even when they're really excited about it and into it, they don't actually know how it works. Um, there's and for, and it's totally fair, right? Um, there's almost no specification. Lib P2P does not have a specification. Um, you know, there's some documents that say that there is a specification, but then when you really dig in, there isn't one. Um, and if you, especially if you compare that to something like HTTP, like HTTP has been knowledge shared like crazy. Like people understand how to implement the HTTP server or quick. The documentation about this stuff is really super good. Um, and if you don't have a spec, um, you really like, um, especially if you don't apply formal methods and stuff like that, like it's just, 
like there's no way that anybody should trust a distributed system with you know a lot of temporal complexity uh with that one um and i think one of the other big problems too is that if you have been a sort of adventurer and you've dug into peer-to-peer -peer code and you said oh cool i'm gonna hack on something um you probably realize that things like dhts they were actually created in the early 2000s before mobile usage patterns arrived and those absolutely shaped like the modern network topologies and so like if you're looking at something like lib p2p or or even like hyper or some of these other things like they kind of don't really make any sense it's sort of regurgitating a bunch of the ideas from you know the early 2000s um dhts not being just vulnerable but they don't have a sense of locality and that's something that's incredibly important in a in a modern network right modern networks are made up of mostly mobile devices and using something like a um a dht is a terrible abstraction because one they're incredibly slow and they're very vulnerable but also um the 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 problem is that you know we're just not devices just aren't on online as long as they were when a lot of these assumptions were made right we're not dealing with home servers um so anyways um yeah there's a lot of complexity there so um you know we uh we have this application and honestly like in if i'm not in person um it's sort of a lame demo because it's just showing you my screen with a chat app on it um, so i'm just gonna kind of skip over this and get to the interesting stuff um there's nothing really that can be proved about me showing you some chats popping up on the screen um i think this is the meat that you guys came for um and uh and i i just want to check in that people can still hear me yeah we can hear you loud and clear uh, okay okay awesome um any any anything that anybody wants to interject like please just interrupt me because this is where it's going to get kind of complicated um so just feel free to like um just just speak up or interrupt me it's fine because like this can be a conversation um so yeah um i'm sure everybody here has heard of nats um obviously firewalls everybody's heard of firewall um these are the bane of our existence and ice is not cutting it um stun and turn servers don't do what we need um it's it's incomplete and i'll get to why it's super incomplete why it's like basically a non-starter um, I mean, it serves some purpose in some ways, but they're not like it's not what we're trying to do here. Like we're trying to have peer-to-peer uh, -peer with like very little or none, no infrastructure at all. So um, the first stage of what we need to do is um, NAT traversal, and um, some people call that hole hole punching. It's not really like the the best way to describe this because more to it. Uh, we call it reflection. Uh, reflection is kind of like looking in the mirror and seeing what you look like, you know, having a mirror to see that. And, and that's what's actually happening. So the, the, the NAT traversal stuff is about figuring out the two primary characteristics about NATs that matter. And, and so <clears throat> why we care about that to start with, the purpose of, of discovering, um, you know, your, your NAT type is because you're going to need to know that in order to negotiate with other peers to determine how you should uh, what, what kind of connection strategy you should you should take? Um, so the first step before you do anything is NAT traversal, um, and we split that up into three stages, two primary stages. Uh, the first stage is um, is, uh, is is asking for the externally facing information about a probe socket. So we have two kind of, we have two sockets on each peer. Um, <clears throat> Each peer needs two sockets, and, and, and that'll become apparent why. Um, but the first socket is the primary socket. The second socket is this, what we, what we kind of call the probe socket. Um, so the first stage, what happens is we send out to another peer, we send out a, 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 a ping message that says, hey, I'm interested in knowing what the externally facing information is about the socket that I'm sending you this this UDP message on. Um, the response back is the uh, address and port. And I'm going to use that stuff um, uh, as we go into the next stage. It's really important for me to first grab the information about the probe socket. Once I have that, then I can start to do some interesting things. So then um, the, the next phase is asking 
two distinctly different peers who are outside of my NAT about um, my primary port, uh, my primary sockets externally facing information. Okay, so what I do is I send them both that same sort of request that I did in stage one, but including the information about my probe sockets externally facing um, uh, uh, address and port. So those get sent off. And then the response back I get um, uh, on my main socket, uh, socket one, I'm, I'm peer three in this case. And uh, what it's telling me is it's telling me the external information. That's like the information that you would see if you were somebody else on the internet, um, you know, viewing, viewing me, talking to you. Um, so, um, so the purpose of this is if the first peer, uh, the first, the first peer responds and it says, okay, your address is 1.1.1.1 and your port is 1.2.3.4. Um, that's great. I, I save that as, uh, you know, information about that response. Now, if peer two responds with the same information, then I can determine the endpoint dependence of the NAT that is in front of my host or my peer, right? And, and the endpoint dependence would be that it's very much open, right? Um, it means that anytime I send a message out to anybody, it's going to be seeing the same information. And so, um, so that means that uh, it's endpoint independent. And uh, some people refer to that as an as a easy NAT. Um, and that is the least amount of work to traverse. Um, if I get back uh, uh, two um, different responses from the peers, then I can know that I am endpoint dependent, which means that every time I send a message out, I'm getting assigned different information by my NAT. And that makes it really difficult to traverse. And in that case, we end up needing to get into um, hole punching uh, or you know, using a birthday paradox to send out a bunch of packets and try to re hopefully receive some of them. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but we're not quite complete yet. So we have two characteristics about endpoint dependence, but we still need to understand the firewall behavior. So in the second state, or the, sorry, the, the second part of stage two, um, what happens is I am going to get responses back, potentially up to uh, two responses, but potentially zero. So um, if I get the first response back um, from peer one, um, well, then you can, you can know that um, peer, uh, peer one on socket one was never contacted by socket one on peer three. So that means that there isn't an address um, restricted NAT. But if I get back that and I get back the other one, I'm the most liberal kind of NAT, I'm an unrestricted NAT. But if I only get back the second part of this, um, where peer two socket one sends um, the address and port to socket two, that means that um, I'm port restricted. So in other words, I would have need, needed to message the address and the port before in order to receive something on that port. So that's a lot to discuss. And, and, and like, I've been discussing this like for hours with these guys, with these like network engineers at Telefonica. So please uh, feel free to ask questions about why we're doing this, what this means, what the purpose of this is, like if any of this makes any sense to anybody, um, feel free to, to chime in. So in stage B, it sounds like there's a question of whether peer one is going to be able to get to peer three. Um, yeah, so. Um, but, but they, so they in, already reached them in stage one. Why is there a question? Well, so in stage one, you can send out a message and you can always get a response back uh, from a peer that is unrestricted. So peer one needs to be an unrestricted peer. Oh, I um, see that this is a response to something that came from socket one. Got it. Okay. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so 
so a couple of data points that I think would be clarifying to me if we went through this from top to bottom would be the distinction between what, uh, what like whether it is important that there's a distinction between what um, payload gets sent back at the application layer uh, uh, from from a particular peer in these in these requests for address port, et cetera. Um, and but to the like what teasing teasing apart it's like what do you think your address and port are versus um what the uh, far end of the connection sees as your remote address and whether that distinction is important information at each of these stages but what i think would be a really useful exercise at this point is to ask does anybody on this call grok this well enough to uh say it back in their own words I can try. I think, I think just just before we do that, I think it'd be pr probably pretty important to point out that this is a very internal part of the protocol. Um, a person using the protocol wouldn't have to really understand this. Um, I mean, we want to understand this as group. That's yeah, totally. But um, but in terms of like an application layer, like you mentioned, um, nobody at the application layer would ever have to think about this. Right. Um, well, that's an important clarification. Yeah, uh, the, yes. And that's a very important attribute that we want to emerge from this. We're, we're on a call with a bunch of implementers <laughs> who yeah. will be interested in uh, who will be interested in seeing the specification and also uh, digging into potentially creating interoperable implementations. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I like I totally agree that the the gap is um, a, a body of folks who understand this this particular layer. Yeah, and I think that we can do multiple sessions on this. Like, I think that, you know, these are just the slides for the talk that I did today, which was for a yeah. bunch of network engineers who, you know, build, um, you know, uh, telco networks. Um, so, so, Paolo, I would propose to give you a choice. Do you want to do this exercise or would you like to get through to the end of your slides before we try something like that? Um, it's, it's up to you guys. I, I'm I'm super happy to chat about it. I'm just because, like, I'm, you know, I, I, I know that uh, Chris has a depth of expertise here, and I just assume that kind of everybody else has lots of knowledge in this area. So, um, or not specifically about this, but just in general uh, with with networking and systems. So, um, you know, let's if somebody's got some uh, uh, questions they want to ask, let's uh, let's try to do a few of them. Yeah, uh, let's uh, let's. I think maybe we should run through to the end of your slides and come back to this one. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, and sorry, I because I'm got this with, with my screen like this, I can't really tell who's talking. So I'll just kind of uh, I'll just I'll try my best to uh, re close the presentation and try to open up the thing so I can see who's talking uh, when they ask questions. Um, okay, so natural reversal is a super important aspect of what's happening because what what the the idea is that you know you want to learn first of all your addressable information so other people can send messages to you but then also um it really um it's really important to be able to determine what kind of strategy people are going to use to actually create that community that, that communication channel once it's ready to happen. So um, you need to nat you need to discover your NAT type first, and then you can pick that um, connection strategy. Um, so I'm going to drop out of this actually real quick and just head over to our documentation um, because there's a kind of an interesting thing here to point out. Um, uh, So uh, this is uh, quite old at this point. This is going to get updated this week uh, or uh, Monday, T Tuesday, Tuesday. Um, but um, but I wanted to point out, which is still relevant here, um, that state. Where is it? Um, Publish state. Join state. This is not, maybe it's not in here. Um, yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. So, um, so once we've learned what our uh, NAT type is, we can then tell other peers in the network that we would like to be introduced to peers that they know, and we can um, prioritize that based on um, you know some kind of common uh, data point. We call it a um, uh, we call it a cluster um, cluster ID. Um, some people call it a topic. Uh, some people call it a swarm ID. Um, but basically, what you're saying is like I know my NAT type. Uh, and now I know my externally facing uh, IP address and my port, and I want to tell people that I want them to connect to me and sync. And so, um, so what we do in this case is we send out this um, this uh, uh, join message. Um, where is it? Um, join. So basically, join just basically goes through a list of uh, list of peers that you have. Um, and says, hey, I would like to be introduced to other peers. So now you can imagine that your start list is, start, is going to start to grow um, with, uh, with introductions. When you get an introduction, that's this packet here, this intro packet, um, what happens is um, it determines your NAT type and how compatible that is with, other, uh, with the other peer that it's trying to introduce you to. So, um, if, for instance, your NAT type is easy and the other NAT type is uh, unrestricted or static, there's basically nothing that needs to be done. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, just uh, send a ping and, um, and that's it. In the case that um, you have one of the NATs uh, that's easy, um, but the other one is hard, then the, um, then the one that's hard will get the message and and the one that's easy will get the message for the for the intro, and they'll both say, "Okay, time to uh, time to start preparing for this uh, connection." And the hard, um, oh, okay, okay. Um, so uh, the uh, hard peer will open up uh, 256 ports. The easy peer will start guessing which ports are open, and because of the birthday paradox, then we have the ability to uh, make that connection faster than it actually sounds <laughs> um, usually happens in under a second. Um, and I'll leave you guys to read a little bit more about the birthday paradox and how that works. Um, the, uh, the other case is that both of the peers are easy. And then if that's the case, uh, the, all they need to do is send a ping to each other. Um, and uh, once, once that ping, opens uh, the port on each who's sending it, then there is a port that's mapped and open and a ping can be sent into that open address uh, on, the, on the return um, when, when the next packet is sent. Um, so, sorry, they're, they're kicking me out of. Yeah, the, quite, uh, a question, so. this is Chris, a question from uh, David Thompson about whether this is UDP or TCP or both. Oh, uh, sorry, I thought I, uh, yeah, I didn't clarify that at the beginning. Um, so uh, this is all UDP. Um, and the reason why we pick uh, UDP is because there is no handshake, there's no opinions, it's, it's, you know, it's the simplest, it's connection, connectionless, um, it uh, uh, doesn't rely on any uh, pieces that uh, could could add more complication. Um, it is possible, apparently, although I, I can't verify this, uh, uh, to do um, natural versus and hole punching with TCP. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, we've actually never tried to do it just because it's so much more complex. So one of these cases, you send between 250 and 1,000 packets to get going. Yeah, so the um, on the easy side, the easy side will start throwing packets and hope that one of them gets into the. Um, so uh, let me let me uh, backtrack just a little bit. So um, of all the kinds of NATs that there are, um, approximately one third of them will be uh, what we call hard NATs. That's symmetrical NATs, NATs that can't be traversed or not traversed. Uh, they can't be. Um, 
um, uh, they can't, they, you can't directly connect to them. Um, and so in that case, um, what happens is uh, you, you have either an easy card or easy, easy. Uh, but if you have two hard, uh, two, two nats that are classified as hard, then, uh, then it won't be possible to communicate between them at all. Um, so there's a, 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 a third of the time, what you'll end up having to do is you'll end up having to play this guessing game, which is where, uh, which is where the birthday paradox comes in. Uh, if, uh, if, you, if you guys kind of remember how it works, it's like where, um, you know, if, if, uh, if there's- Yeah, it's clear uh, there, why you, I mean, what the result is, but it's just, I, I guess I'm old school or something, but there used to be this TCP slow start and stuff. The idea of sending a thousand messages just to say hello is like, um, yeah, a thousand UDP packets um, at like a few bytes each. Um, you generally send them at about ten milliseconds apart. Um, and uh, you know, according to the research uh, that we've read and our experience, um, you know, using this is uh, you know it's well under the threshold for a net finding it suspicious. You know, given you know how many packets go out at what velocity on the streaming, um, so you know this video call, for example, right, is like far more than a thousand packets um, per second. So, um, so it's a, it, it sounds like a lot, but it's actually like not that many, and it happens usually under a second. Okay, and it doesn't happen a lot. No, it only happens every thirty seconds if you're on, like I said, that one third of the type of net that's unaddressable. So it, it is a bit of a use uh, uh, edge case, but it's all it's a very important edge case because if you don't get it right, um, like most peer-to-peer -peer protocols don't get this right. LibPP, for example, doesn't get this right. Hyper doesn't know how to do this. Um, this is a very, very, very important part of the protocol because at one this one third, right? So um, so you want to want to be able to establish that connection. Once you have it open, you can send it a heartbeat that keeps that uh, port open, and you don't have to um, do this whole punching process. Again. Right. Um, so that's just getting connected. So there, so there's. I feel like we'll, we'll definitely have to do more sessions on this. But like, so the natural rehearsal part of it is like, I figuring, I'm figuring out what my addressable information is, and then I'm telling other people what it is I want to be introduced. And then the next stage after that is actually connecting, which we just talked about. But then once you're connected, cool. Now you can send messages to people. Um, but the really important part after that is like, well, what happens if like all the peers that um that are in my network go offline? Um, and so here's where I'm going to open this um, going to this slide. Um, and and everybody can still see my screen. You're visible. Yes, we can. Cool. Awesome. Um, so so this is called network buffering. So I ran a conference um, for many many years. Um, mostly appearing in Berlin called VPN, uh, which is like sort of like uh, if anybody's familiar with NPM, NPM had like a lot of sort of spell outs that were funny or whatever. VPN uh, really ultimately stands for uh, Disruption Tolerant Networks. It's a pretty well uh, established ac academic research area. Um, and it was kind of discovered, I think, a lot in part by DARPA. Uh, the idea was. Um, has been has been applied to um, to quite a bit of uh, research in um, everywhere from you know uh, vehicle routing to military stuff. And basically, the idea is that you want to you want to be able to send messages in a network and make sure that um, even if uh, the, the the people in your group go offline, that there'll still be more people that you can connect to, even though they might not be related to your group. When I say group, I mean cluster, I mean um, you know, swarm ID or whatever, whatever you want to call it. The thing that identifies your um, your interest group that you want to be connected to most of the time. And so this illustration kind of goes over that. Um, so the idea is that a good, a well-designed peer-to-peer protocol is cooperative, right? Connectivity um, and packet relay are this sort of shared responsibility. So you have a mother net, that's every single connection that ever gets made with your protocol. And then under the hood, you have um, 
you know, this, or, or, or sorry, with not under the hood, but in, within that, you have, um, you know, clusters. Um, and then if, for instance, I'm in the little app cluster, I don't have a lot of users, and those users go offline, I should be able to send a message to, um, uh, I should be able to um, broadcast or uh, multicast out a message that is received by people, and it shouldn't matter who it is. Um, this is the epidemic broadcasting nature of this kind of protocol. So for contrast, you, you may have a protocol like, um, um, well, like um, libp2p or anything that uses a, a DHT. Um, that's gonna be what's called a forwarding protocol. It's going to try to forward other peers a canonical sort of phone book about the state of the world. And everybody's going to be kind of racing to keep that up to date and make you know all kinds of security um, acrobatics or whatever to make sure that um, nobody's doing malicious things with it. Um, that's a forwarding protocol, forwarding the phone book. Um, a replicating protocol like this actually takes multiple copies of a smaller uh, set of data, um, just the peer and the message and the packet that they're trying to actually send. And then it um, forwards that on. And um, eventually what happens is when the peers in your network do come up online, they'll receive um, that message and then become consistent, eventually consistent. Um, so uh, there's there's obviously there's waste in this model. And you can kind of tell, um, you can kind of see where, you know, some of these arrows go off and, you know, Try to imagine a production version of this where there's lots of replication. That's okay. Um, that's the that's the sort of um, cost of casting a wide net and getting responses back faster and ensuring that there's liveness in the network. That means that um, there's a guarantee that um, you know there will always be a good thing that happens at one point during the. Um, you know, d during this, uh, uh, this this workflow, right? Of me creating a packet, not having anyone in my group to send it to, sending it out, and then eventually people in my group seeing that packet. Um, th does that make sense to everybody? In the abstract, yes. <laughs> right. Um, so um, yeah, so so the the specification that we have currently on the website is a draft, and um, we've been we've spent the last like two months uh, just curiously writing uh, specifications about this stuff and digging into um, a formal proof for it. And so um, you know, there's there's a, a paper that I think pro probably everybody here would be really excited about uh, that is um, uh, one of the one of the main papers that we uh, that we cite in the specification um, I'm just, uh, I'm just grab. Um, so we, we cite uh, a couple of these things um, but mainly mainly this one. Um, and so why this is really pretty interesting um, is because they provide empirical evidence that a um, replicated uh, protocol um, can often outperform uh, an oracle based protocol like uh, something like a DHT. Um, so I would I would recommend anybody reading anybody to read the max prop uh, paper um, because it really um, it really illustrates pretty well um, you know the the optimizations that are possible we haven't even applied all of them but there's a lot of optimizations that can be applied that um, can uh, that can in, in improve the potential um, you know time that peers can become consistent um, what we've done is we've got to the point where we have something that works reliably, and I can see the next couple of years building a community of people who understand how to implement uh, a protocol like this and are able to, you know, see optimizations in it, how it could be improved, 
Um, but you know, at the moment, it's it's like 2,000 lines of JavaScript. So I think that anybody in this room can probably port this to probably any other language. Um, we have a C99 implementation that's almost done. Uh, we kind of started on a Rust implementation, but like uh, we got sidetracked with the Zig implementation of it. Um, it was kind of all sort of simultaneously fell in love with Zig. Um, so um, yeah, I, there's a lot here um, to talk about. And I feel like I've been talking for a while now, almost an hour. So I feel like there's probably um, maybe, maybe too much really even to, you know, um, uh, uh, to, to keep going on this without you know, getting into some Q&A. Um, but I think that probably the best thing to do is have a couple of sessions on this. And, and, um, and I can even build some specific slides for this group because I think that this group is you know, a, a, on a particular, particular skill level. Uh, this, this deck that I just built today, this was for uh, the engineers at Telefonica. So um, yeah, uh, let me know what you guys think. Well, first off, I'm going to get in touch with you for links to all of these papers, especially first and foremost, your specification documents so that the folks here can give it a read. Um, I think that that will be probably the most useful. Um, I, I think folks here will be interested in a practical demonstration and also a better understanding of the underlying protocol. Yeah, it's um, it's not trivial. It has temporal properties that are difficult to drop. It has like you know, the, the notion of different actors doing things at different times and different orders. And it, yeah, it's it's a lot to wrap your head around at first. So um, I think it takes a couple sessions. Um, and um, and I think before people can really start giving like critical feedback and understanding uh, the the sort of real real nuances of it. Um, uh, yeah, you, you need to kind of go through it a few times, but uh, but maybe there's some questions that people have that are uh, so far on, on what we talked about. Maybe not a question, but just sort of a level set thing. So a big goal here is a bunch of people have mobile phones all cooperating, never mind any servers. Yeah, uh, the idea is to minimize the infrastructure that any, <clears throat> like, you know, any any kind of application developer should never need it to, to provision any infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I told the, <clears throat> the Telefonica people today, I said, I, I think that there's a fundamental conflict of interest between public infrastructure that runs the internet and, uh, and, and capital, uh, capitalism. <laughs> um, you know, I think that uh, what, what runs the internet uh, can't be a, a, a landlord like AWS. Um, and so I think that the, the less infrastructure there is, the better, right? Because then we can focus on, you know, creating interesting products and projects and, and things that uh, add value uh, and get away from that sort of landlord tenancy, which, you know, a lot, a lot of people, I think, you know, they have interesting projects. They come up with, you know, a really great idea, something that might fundamentally improve humanity. And then they, they go and they say, well, you know, the, the, the conversation ends at, well, I don't know how we would afford to do that. <laughs> you right. know, so that, that's a big driver for this is like coming up with a way that, you know, we can kind of level the playing field in terms of like, you know, uh, how we can leverage the infrastructure that exists in the wild today to create a kind of infrastructure of commons. Uh, I got a question. Um, apologies if you covered it already. I missed the first part. What's the story on flow control and rate limiting or uh, like pushback, back pressure? Yeah. So, um, so with uh, with with you know um, uh, slow start things like that, um, <clears throat> that's really just you know saying <clears throat> I'm going to send a bunch of packets um, and I'm going to make sure that um, I start off slower and if I continue to receive you know good news about what I'm doing, I know the pipe size and and you can kind of adjust accordingly. Um, there is no notion of um, of, of trying to mitigate, uh, you know, how big the pipe is, um, because really, um, I think that that's something that can be added on top as a plugin or as an application layer thing. It really depends on what you're trying to do with the protocol, right? So, um, so for instance, if I'm doing video, um, like you know, big video group or whatever, uh, group calls kind of something like this, 
um, I really need deep, deep, deep control over that stuff. And you know, something like slow start it, is not going to be good enough, most likely. Um, and so we just refrain from trying to have an opinion about that. Um, something interesting about the uh, protocol, if you've read the uh, existing spec, I know it's a little bit old, but um, <clears throat> but the way that we reframe packets, uh, the UDP packets, is that um, they all have a SHA-256 hash in the header of the content. And uh, each new packet that gets created um, is also given the previous ID. And so why this is kind of interesting is because this gives causality in a global uh, in, a, in a global network. Yep. And so if I'm a peer who's you know really counting on reliability, I can say, oh, you know, what happened to this packet? Like this was essential. I need this packet, or I can't you know uh, hash the you know the image that came uh, to me correctly. Um, so having that um, causally ordered uh, or ca causally linked uh, packets. I think is is really is important, um, and you know there's things like that that we did say that we cared about, um, but those are sort of more fundamental things rather than like performance or interface. Cool. This rhymes with a a thing that Brian and I have talked about in the past about yeah. um, using a, a a content address store. But the, the interesting thing about that is that. Um, you get causal order, but you don't have to have a total order like you did with a TCP stream mm -hmm. with a with a congestion window. Yeah, um, yeah, and and, and a big part of um, a big part of the TCP that you know is, is unfortunate is the head of line blocking problem, right? And you know if 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 that's not something that you that that matters, right? You know, uh, you know specifically the the order in which packets are delivered, then you know having that problem at all is, is kind of unfortunate, you know. Um, so, you know, being able to, to entirely, you know, not have the head of line blocking problem by allowing any peer to deliver a packet in any order by anyone is like a, a pretty cool uh, capability. No, oh, it's, it's a lot more than that, really, because then we can do, um, then we can decouple prioritization and congestion avoidance, mm -hmm. and load shedding. Yeah. Um, do probabilistic shedding and preserving cohorts of preserving cohorts of requests. I think what the implication for us is through the eventual send API, we can have additional arguments on what our our e our e constructor that would allow us to have a finer finer grain level of control about um, uh, deliverability constraints and reliability needs um, in a distributed network. So there's a lot there's a lot here that's that's interesting and also what you're saying about congestion and avoidance and control flow in general about punting that to the application layer that is at least consistent with uh with what quick has uh, HTTP 3 does where they rebuilt that on top of uh of of UDP and then reconstructed streaming on top of that for the flow of an individual threads of RPC but the uh, um but yeah, they have application level, level hooks where you can br bring your own congestion avoidance and control flow algorithm. But but also, yeah. but I also come from the old school camp that Dan mentions, where uh, I yeah. was I was at briefly at a networking startup that was doing um, uh, a slow start alternative network stack at the BSD operating system level um, mm -hmm. to do uh, control delay codel. Um, on the sender yeah, side yeah. only, which was really good for streaming video in particular, without needing a lot of application level knobs, it was able to. Uh, it, it basically, you can parameterize its aggressiveness, um, mm -hmm. and and still generally cooperate with the uh, with, with the, the the objective is to to meet, to, have, to meet your own needs without causing congestion collapse of the internet as a whole, which is the kind of thing that is possible when you have a fully peer-to-peer -peer arrangement with, if, if you get popular yeah. enough <laughs> yeah yeah so, well one of the one of the other things too is that so i, I don't know if you guys I, I chris i think you might know joe will um but you know he's a member of a bunch of uh, codec committees and stuff and he's really, really got some strong opinions on uh, streaming video and stuff like that and so uh that was really a mandate that came from him was basically saying like i want absolute control <laughs> um 
uh, over this over this particular type of thing. Uh, because you know we do want to do some proof of concept stuff with uh, video streaming, audio streaming, really high quality stuff. Um, and so that was a yeah that was a, a mandate that, that came in from, from that angle. Having yeah, that level that's... of flexibility is nice. It, it's always you know a trade off with how much work does user space have to do for whatever their basic use cases are. But I imagine that over time people will put together libraries to handle you know the the, the top three use cases. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been great. Uh, we're coming up close to time. I want to make sure that everybody else has an opportunity to ask Paul follow questions if you've got them. All right. Um, follow. I'm going to follow up with you to get links to all of these resources so that folks following along and we can talk about um, we can talk about a venue for this conversation because it isn't strictly an endo conversation. It's not strictly an OCAPN conversation, but it is related to both of our needs. Um, that's a uh... yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would love to, um, I would love to, um, yeah, put something together where you know people that wanted to uh, to to go deep on this stuff and and really dig in uh, had the opportunity to. Um, uh, to ask all those questions and stuff. And I, I think, you know, there's, there's a benefit to us uh, in that, you know, there's uh, smart people asking hard questions. Um, that's, that's really great. And, uh, you know, give, give you the opportunity to, to reflect and to, um, and to, you know, make sure that uh, you know, you're thinking about it from all the, all the various angles. So, um, yeah, we can figure that out offline. Um, and, uh, yeah, feel free, anybody, uh, feel free just to hit me up um, on wherever. And I'm always around, always working on this stuff. So, um, yeah, well, thanks for having me on your guys' chat. Of course, thank you. Cool. All right, ciao.